Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Come on in. Grab a seat. Grab a hot chocolate if it's cold where you are. I'm Robin Pollock. I'm your moderator today. I'm from Poor Homeopathy Canada. We welcome you back to our webinar series. We have been generously uh, gifted with two fabulous veterinarians in the last two months, Dr. Wendy Jensen last month, and now we have Dr. Richard Pitcairn, who I'll introduce to you in just one second. Just wanted to remind you all about For Homeopathy Canada's mandate, which is to educate uh, people uh, like you, people who are not uh, educated as homeopaths, um, in the ways of homeopathy, in the beauties of homeopathy, how to use it at home, how to feel confident using it for first aid and acute situations. And to that extent, we try to educate you through our webinars. That's one of the ways that we're doing it. And so we welcome you here today. So let me just introduce to you, Dr. Richard Pitcairn, whom you see in front of you. I'll give you a short bio. Uh, he's been a veterinarian since 1965 when he graduated from the University of California at Davis and then a mere two years later which gives you an idea of what a great educator he is he started teaching at the Washington State University as an assistant professor and then he started graduate school eventually uh, getting his PhD in microbiology in 1972 so he wore a, a triple hat of practitioner researcher and teacher in the veterinary school and he had a particular interest in nutrition and its effects on immunity and as a result, resistance to disease. About 10 years later, 1982, he and his wife published the first edition of his famous Dr. Pitcairn's Complete Guide to Natural Health for Dogs and Cats. So that's a book that you can go out and buy and use for your own pets at home, which at the time I wrote this biography, it was in its fourth edition. I'm not sure if it's gone beyond that and it was sold well over 500,000 copies. So you know that it's an extremely popular book and well worth purchasing. Uh, along the way, Dr. Pitcairn developed an interest in homeopathy, which is why he's here with you today. And he studied uh, especially the teachings of Hahnemann, Ken Flippe, Tyler Vitulkas, and Andre Sane. So for those of you who are familiar with those names, you know that he liked to stick with the classics, although coming into the modernity by studying people like Andre Sane and Vitulkas. And in 1985, he moved to Eugene, Oregon, to establish a practice solely devoted to the use of homeopathy and nutritional therapy. In 1992, to show you uh, how he continued his academic work, uh, he uh, started the professional course in veterinary homeopathy, which is a year-long postgraduate training for veterinarians in the use of homeopathy in their practices. And this is the short bio, Richard, that I promised I would give. And as of, there's a lot more folks. And as of 2016, over 500 veterinarians have been trained in this program offered by the Pitcairn Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy. And finally, in 1995, he and his associates co-founded the Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy, the first professional organization of practicing veterinary homeopaths in the United States. So you can rest assured that this is an extremely educated and capable man who will be teaching you today. And for any of you out there who are homeopaths, if you don't already have his New World Veterinary Repertory that he wrote with Dr. Wendy Jensen, who was here last month, I highly encourage you to do so. It is a font of rubrics for your pets that you can use with absolute certainty. So, it's your turn, Dr. Richard Pitker, and I happily present you to my 4-H Canada audience. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, lovely introduction. Um, can I hire you to go around and uh, promote me? Oh, it'll be my absolute pleasure. <laughs> you can just you just get just give me doggy treats. I'll be happy. Oh, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, what my in intention is with this presentation is to. Uh, uh, give you more of a context of how homeopathy fits into the whole medical field, um, you know, rather than, and, and then, than talk about prescribing or techniques or things like that. And, and the reason for that is I find it really helpful to people to um, have some kind of a, a more um, inclusive understanding of homeopathy because it's, it can be confusing. <clears throat> There's different ideas about it. And you may have come in by, say, uh, learning the method uh, in the sense of how to, you know, prescribing remedies based on a book or something. And, and then it gets kind of confusing about what other method you should use with it and, 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 you know, how does it relate to the rest of medicine and so on. I find the most, for, le for me at least, the, what is most useful is to, have some 
have some understanding of the of what homeopathy is. Uh, and the way I was going to approach that here is I'm first going to talk to you briefly about the discovery that Hahnemann made, <clears throat> so you can see how its distinctiveness. <coughs> Excuse me. I was hoping I wouldn't have to cough. And my wife and I went on a, a little uh, trip in France about three weeks ago, and we picked up bronchitis. <laughs> it was a gift from the French people. And so I still have a little bit of a cough that comes on occasionally. So anyway, what I'm going to do is first talk to you a little bit about Hahnemann's discovery, so you can see the significance of it. And then I'm going to present a case to you, an animal case, and how we work through it with just homeopathy. And then after that, go into more detail about the method of healing that homeopathy initiates. Okay, so uh, let's start with um, um, well, I guess this is, <laughs> this is what we just talked about here. <coughs> um, so <clears throat> the homeopathic method starts with Hahnemann. And Hahnemann, he was a pretty sharp guy. He, he got his medical degree, um, and he, he was... Um, also a person that knew several different languages, I think seven or eight languages, something like that. So he's pretty sharp. <clears throat> and he went into practice and after five years he, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> after five years he withdrew from practice because he just felt like he just didn't have any certainty about how medicine should be used. And he turned instead to making his living writing books on medicine and translating medical texts. And it was quite a, a change for him because he kind of went into almost into um, poverty to do that. In other words, he gave up the income from medicine and he, he would work, um, I think I read somewhere that because he had a small place with his children and his wife, he would work, uh, you know, to have some quiet, he would work, stay up every other night through the night working on his translations. So he was a very dedicated person. Here's what he, uh, a, a little bit of what he said in communication with other doctors. It was agony for me to always walk in darkness with no other light than that which could be derived from books when I had to heal the sick and to prescribe <clears throat> according to such and such a hypothesis concerning diseases, substances which owed their place in materia medica to an arbitrary decision. There was really no good guidance as to how to use medicines. It was a lot of ideas and theories and hearsay and so on. So the the critical thing with in terms of homeopathy was that when he was translating this prominent medical text by a Dr. Cullen, who I think was a Scottish doctor, if I remember right. <coughs> um, Cullen was writing about the use of Peruvian bark. It was a bark of a tree from Peru that the missionaries had brought back. And it, it seemed to be very effect, unusually effective in treating fever and malaria and so on, more than other substances. And, and, and nobody knew why it, it was more obviously effective. <clears throat> so the author of the book, Cullen, had written that it was effective because it was very bitter. And it affected the stomach. And Hahnemann looks at that and says, he writes in, in the margin, he says, other herbs and substances are even more bitter. And they don't have that effect. So you can see he was being rather logical about it. <coughs> Hopefully my cough will stop soon here because I haven't been talking for a while. So sometimes I get going and it, it stimulates it. He decides to try taking the herb himself and he takes a dose twice a day and the effect was that he developed most of the symptoms of what was called intermittent fever, the chill and the sweat and all the other things. And then when he would stop it, taking it, he'd become normal. So he repeated this several times. So he asked, 
Does the bark then produce the same symptoms as it removes? Does it both produce and cure fever? See, that was the, that was the question. So he spent six years testing this, testing different substances, trying them in clinical situations before he finally felt confident enough to go ahead and spread it to other doctors. So you, you see he was very scientific, very determined. <clears throat> so um, it's important, the reason I'm going through this with you, a lot of you probably already know this, but the reason I'm mentioning it to you is it's important to realize this is really a significant discovery. There was nothing like this in medicine before. And um, there was something new. You know, what, how could something that produced similar symptoms in a patient cause them to get well? You see, that was the puzzle. So that's what we're going to go into here. All right? <coughs> so we have an example case. And this is a horse. Um, uh, belonged to a fellow named Alberto. He was a veterinarian that was taking training on a homeopathy course with us. And he lives in Long, lived in Long Island. And he had a horse pasture, which of course he'd used for some time. And he turns the horse out in the pasture and it comes back injured. And it was quite a mystery. Like, how could it have been injured? There was nothing out in the pasture that, that could have caused any problem. There was nobody around that was, that was observed, you know, but somehow the horse injured itself. And later on, he kind of thought maybe the horse had fallen next to a telephone pole and there was a wire sticking up or something. Anyway, we're not really sure what happened, but I'm going to, the next picture, you should be sitting down because it's a little bit shocking to see. But the horse came back to his barn in this condition. <coughs> <clears throat> so you can see then this this is the uh, up here is a horse's neck and head and these are the legs down here and you can see that the whole chest was torn open by whatever happened to the horse and this injury occurred in uh, 2007 as you see I, I put the dates in so you can get an idea of the timing of the response <clears throat> so February 23rd was when the horse showed up with this injury. Here's another view of it, another picture of it, same day. Now, the veterinarian, before contacting me, uh, sutured it up. Of course, that's what veterinarians do, right? So this part here was where sutures had been put in. To try to pull it together and this part he couldn't get together it was too much tension <coughs> <coughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> all the unnecessary coughing but there it is <clears throat> so anyway he did this uh seven days after the injury this is what it looked like from the being sutured up and here's another picture of it a little closer <clears throat> and then after 10 days, see the prior one was uh, March 2nd, and now this is March 5th, three days later, you see what's happened now is this whole sutured area has come open on its own and it's hanging down, some of the dead tissue hanging down like this with the sutures in it. <clears throat> this is not unusual. If you have a place like this, where there's a lot of tension, uh, the sutures really don't hold. You know, they can't. There's just too much pull on them. Looks pretty nasty, doesn't it? So he cleans it up a little bit. Uh, he cleaned it up with just some saline, which is a, you know, a salt solution similar to blood. It's important to point out here, before I forget, that no antibiotics were used in this case or other drugs like that just some homeopathic remedies and saline. <clears throat> so here he cleaned it up a little bit, trimmed off some of the dead tissue as best he could and washed it off as best he could. So this is 11 days after the injury. This is his daughter, it was his daughter's horse. 
<clears throat> 14 days after the injury. Now, it's looking a little, I know it may not look this way to your eyes, but actually it looks a little bit better, a little smaller, and not so much dead tissue hanging off of it. This is 19 days after the, and she's holding up a ruler here. See some idea of the size of it. 22 days after, you see how it's smaller? Let's go back, you see? Now it's smaller uh, from what it was. It's about two inches deep. <clears throat> and here it is 28 days afterwards. In the fifth week after the injury, <clears throat> the sixth week, and this, what you're seeing here, this is fresh tissue that's growing in, filling it in. <clears throat> and this is the seventh week, eighth week, ninth, and tenth and finally healed. Now there is a scar there, but eventually that scar will get smaller and smaller, so it won't be so obvious. <clears throat> so it took about 11, maybe 11, 12 weeks, up to three months to completely heal, but still it looks pretty good, doesn't it, considering how bad it was at the beginning. All right, so what remedies were used? <clears throat> he used saline, as I mentioned, which is the uh, same as blood without the cells in it. You know, it's a salt solution. He didn't uh, necessarily use uh, sterile saline. That's not really necessary. He just made it up himself in a kitchen. You can add salt to pure water. <clears throat> <clears throat> the first remedy used was arnica, not surprising, and then later calendula, and then the last one that was used was calcarea carbonica. So three remedies were used throughout that period of time. Why arnica? Arnica is a remedy, uh, I'm sure you guys know this, <clears throat> is a remedy made from a plant, leopard's bane, which grows in the mountains. It's when taken by healthy persons, tested, it brings about sensations of an injury, pain, soreness, as if sprain, and a tendency to hemorrhage. So it's interesting in people that are affected by it, by taking the plant too long, too much of it, develop these symptoms. So what we call homeopathic proving would include this, that you would, even though you're not injured, you'd feel like you were injured as far as its pain and soreness, and maybe even some bleeding. There's no other remedy that's more similar to injury effects of the tissues than is Arnica. <clears throat> One that's related to it is Bellus perennis, <clears throat> and that's very much like Arnica, but a little bit more suitable for injury of the internal parts of the body. <clears throat> Why Calendula? This is from the pot marigold flower, which grows worldwide. There's 20 species. <clears throat> it's used extensively during the Civil War to control hemorrhage. There are a lot of wounds. And this was not homeopathic use necessarily. It was known as an herb to be effective. Calendula is, is especially indicated for lacerated wounds, or in other words, cut open, uh, or wounds producing pus. So it's one of its indications in homeopathy is the wounds that are cut open like this where the tissues are exposed, especially if it's a very large wound. <laughs> it prevents infection and restores vitality to the tissues. And then calcarea carbonica, which is from the middle layer of the oyster shell, or more recently times uh, extracting lime from chalk, <clears throat> One of the most important remedies in Materia Medica, <clears throat> primary indication for wounds is that the tissues seem unhealthy, or even small wounds do not heal and become ulcerated. In horses, 
there's unhealthy pus production that's extremely bad smelling. Uh, wounds that remain open and do not heal, remain raw and inflamed or very painful. And the last thing is desire to eat earth, clay, coal, chalk, and so on. This particular coarse case never did produce any pus. And uh, it was healing. So the only indication that <clears throat> pointed us to calcarea carbonica towards the end of the treatment, I, I don't remember exactly the timing. I would say calcarea probably came in several weeks after the injury, maybe half or two thirds of the way through the process. Because the horse went on and started eating dirt. And when we saw that happening, we said, aha, you know, we, what this horse is wanting is some kind of a mineral or something, but it's an indication for calcarea carbonica when the animal or person starts to eat this kind of thing. So he got one dose of calcarea carbonica. And of course, as we see, the horse did recover steadily. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is talk to you about wounds. <clears throat> now that we've seen the case, and we saw what it could look like with homeopathic treatment instead of using other medications. Now I'm going to explain to you the understanding of what happens with homeopathy. So we, to do that, we have to look at the healing process. So bear with me. You don't have to memorize all this stuff, but I'll just review it with you so you have some sense of it. <clears throat> The first stage when there's a wound like this, as you know, I'm sure most of you have been injured, is that you feel pain. And the purpose of that is that you don't overuse it then. If it's injured, you don't want to stress it so it doesn't heal. So the pain keeps you aware that it shouldn't be overdone. Then there's bleeding, which flushes out the area. <clears throat> so if there's any like, uh, foreign material, a stick, um, thorns, anything like that, bacteria that get in from the injury, the bleeding will flush it out, in a sense, clean it out. So it has a purpose, bleeding has a purpose. And then there's the release of histamine <clears throat> and other factors from the injury. And what that does, it's it, those, uh, substances that are released like that are taken into the blood and circulate through the body to alert the rest of the body to give attention to this injured area. So it calls in um, what happens after this. <clears throat> so the second stage is where there's swelling around the wound. And what's happening there when there's swelling is that blood is flowing into the area. In other words, that the swelling is because the blood vessels are enlarging. And there's more blood flow that brings in cells that are gonna repair the injury. That's uh, its function, it's its response. <coughs> That's the response to the, the signal. And then of course there's clotting eventually. Uh, which seals off the wound, uh, not happens right away, but it happens later that it clots. And then um, third stage is that cells come in from the blood into the affected area to do the repair. And there's different factors for the plasma, which is the fluid part of blood as well. So the most important ones are what we call monocytes. So they're the ones that circulate in the blood. <clears throat> And when they migrate into tissues, um, they're called macrophages. Uh, the reason for a difference in name is macrophages are normally found in your tissues throughout the body. They, in other words, the normal, it's no, quite normal that <clears throat> these cells are, even without an injury or anything else, the cells are always moving from the blood into your tissues and sit there and wait there in case there's a problem. They don't do anything else other than watch for infection or injury or whatever. And that when they're in the tissues, they're called macrophages. The word phage means, uh, it's a word, I, I don't know if it's from Latin or what, but it's, it means to eat. And we'll see, that's what they do. <clears throat> so 
So they're the primary defenders of the tissue. And they eat up germs and they eat up the cells that are infected by bacteria or viruses or whatever. They can eat up to 100 bacteria. They've got big appetites. And they also then, um, you know, sitting, in other words, they're the first ones that respond when there's an injury like this. They um, start immediately reacting and eating up any foreign material, dead cells, bacteria, and then they release a signal I mentioned earlier <clears throat> that brings in other cells. And, and what we're referring to there primarily is what's called neutrophils. Again, you don't have to remember any of this. I'm just explaining it to you. And then that neutrophils come in in large numbers. And their role is to eat bacteria, viruses, and foreign material. They're the secondary defenders. Oh, I misspelled secondary. Okay. <coughs> they eat bacteria and viruses. <coughs> Actually, literally take them into their cells. Uh, they don't have such big stomachs. They can take anywhere from 2 to 20. Uh, and then what happens when they get filled up? They just basically dissolve. They break down. The germs in that process that they take in are killed and digested, but the cells then uh, themselves dissolve. You know, I don't know why that is exactly, but uh, maybe they may, maybe there's something I don't understand about the function of that. But anyway, that's what happens, and um, they release also hydrogen peroxide to kill cells. So when they when they break down like that then well, that's what, uh, what we call pus. The white stuff is the dead neutrophils that have filled up and broken down. So pus is a positive thing. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the cells that have done their job and now it's going to be expelled from the body. Maybe that's why it becomes liquid is so it can be discharged. Probably makes sense. Now the fourth stage is the healing or reparative process. So uh, what's involved in that is walling off the injury or the infection and little clots form from the blood called fibrogen, fibrinogen clots. And these little clots then prevent bacteria from moving away from the injury into the other parts of the body <clears throat> to create a barrier. It's not blood clots, they're protein clots. Then we have granulation tissue. <clears throat> and these are, what this is, is uh, cells that are called fibroblasts that live in the tissue. And that we'll get into that a little bit more here in a second. And fibroblasts are the cells that form what we call connective tissue. So all the tissue that's underneath the skin, between the skin and the muscles and bones, all of that is connective tissue. And the fibroblasts are the cells that grow that. So like uh, in this case with a horse, and you know, what was, uh, we'll see in the, another picture coming up, is this part of the body that was damaged, the connective tissue. So a fibroblast will then grow to repair the area. And then the last thing is wound contraction. And I'm going to explain that in a little more detail because this is very important to understand. <clears throat> so here we are looking at the the injury as it was when it was fresh and all of this um, this area you're seeing here is connective tissue you see the skin edge of the skin is here it's pulled away and underneath all of this is your muscle but we're not seeing the muscle we're seeing what's called a connective tissue between the skin and the muscle so this is what the fibroblasts make So fibroblasts are in the connective tissue. They sit in there and they form this uh, material. Uh, these are the fibroblast cells, these little guys. And all this other stuff here is what they make, which we call connective tissue, all right, which is product of the cells. So this is the way it would look if you had, you know, your, your connective tissue is normal and healthy. You'd have a few fibroblasts here and there. <clears throat> but they're not particularly active. What happens in an injury is the fibroblasts start to grow, increase in number. And when they do that, very interestingly, they hook up to each other. 
and they hook up with these little, these are the cells then, these are the fibroblast cells, these little guys. And these little connections are between the cells and they're like little muscle fibers in a way as far as their function. So what they do is they, they all the fibroblasts hook up with each other and start to pull, pull towards each other. Isn't that amazing that the body is so clever that it knows how to do that? I mean, just imagine, we don't think of the body as that intelligent ordinarily, right? I mean, it's like that it would know this kind of thing, but it knows there's an opening. It knows it has to be reduced in size. It produces cells that hook up to each other and start to pull the whole tissue together. Isn't that amazing? So let's look at it again from that standpoint that what's happening is underneath the injury or in the injury itself in the tissue, these fibroblasts are growing and they're joining up and they're pulling the tissue together. So look at this now, you'll understand a different angle on this as we go through the pictures. And so here's March 9th, the 23rd, fifth week, Six week now, and what you see here, this is uh, the, all the granulation tissue, we call it, which is the fibroblast growing. Seventh week, eighth week, ninth. So you see, all of this that we just saw here <clears throat> is entirely the fibroblast connecting to each other and pulling the wound closed. And it happens on its own, normally. <clears throat> so, the method of homeopathy, considering this context that we just looked at. The homeopathic method, as you know, is to use substances that bring about a condition similar to what the patient is already experiencing. <clears throat> So we use a substance, whether it's arnica or calendula or whatever it is, whatever the remedy is from, we use that substance that's been tested already, we know what it will do. And we give it to the patient to have an effect. And the effect that we're intending to have is that it's gonna create a change in the patient so that they have something very similar to what's already there the same kind of a feeling. Now, of course, if we gave Arnica to a healthy person, they're not gonna have a wound open up like this horse has. That's not what's gonna happen. It's just gonna be all the sensations. You know, some of the pains, maybe, maybe some of the swelling, I don't really know if it does that. But some of the pain and soreness and increased blood flow and so on. So that it's gonna create a very similar condition from a functional standpoint. It's not going to create a wound. This effect that it has, we call the primary effect. So Hahnemann called it the primary effect, which is a direct action of the remedy. It's very similar to how a drug acts. So we can say that this primary effect is what the, what the remedy does to the patient, how it changes them. It occurred, the primary effect occurs right away. As soon as you take the remedy, it's starting to do it but it lasts a short time. <clears throat> and by a short time, I mean, depending on the kind of case it is, acute versus chronic, it could be a few minutes to an hour or two, but it doesn't last very long. It's not like days or weeks or anything, it's just a short time. Then the individual responds to that effect, and that response comes entirely from the patient. It's not the remedy, not the substance doing it. It's the patient responding to what was done. And that response is called a counteraction. That's what Hahnemann called it, the counteraction. In other words, it's an action against what was just done. Hahnemann had found in his study of this whole homeopathic effect is that <clears throat> the, um, when this is done, something similar is used it has to be similar if it's the same it just causes more more suffering but if it's something similar not exactly the same 
and it creates this, uh, the, uh, the primary effect is one that sort of, in a sense, magnifies what's already there. It causes more healing response for the patient. So the counteraction is then the homeopathic response. <clears throat> the counteraction is a, a response that occurs on an energy level, and it uses the body, the physical mechanisms, to heal. Primarily inflammation is the method that's used. Now, when we say energetic response, we mean it's occurring at the level of what Hahnemann referred to as the life force. It's not physical. It's, on, uh, it's, it's a, uh, just a change in the intelligence of the body that then uses what's available for healing, like the fibroblasts and the macrophages and all those other things, to restore health. So, the mechanism that then is used to heal, as we just went through with this wound, is inflammation. And inflammation is the basic method the body uses to recover health, whether it be an injury or infection or whatever. The counteraction begins after the primary effect. And in the acute case, the, the counteraction is within minutes. And that's why you'll see in some of these cases you treat, they respond so quickly, it's just dramatic. Because the counteraction is so quick. In a chronic case, it's, it's usually a day or two before you see the counteraction. <clears throat> and really what you can relate it to is how active the life force of the patient is. In an acute injury, it's usually quite active, right? It's really geared up because of what's going on. Whereas a chronic case, it may have been going on for months or years and it's kind of low level responsiveness. So that's why there's a difference in timing. This response, the counteraction, is what restores health. And it continues on its own. In other words, it's not the remedy acting. It initiates a change in the patient, a healing response that goes on its own until the cure is accomplished. There's no other option for the body to heal itself. It has to go through this process. It is most important that the counteraction is not interfered with. Right, that's obvious, but I'll just point it out to you. It's very important that in the homeopathic method, that once we've initiated this response in the patient, that we do not disturb it. <clears throat> so what would interfere with it? <coughs> <coughs> there are two ways in which the counteraction is, is disrupted. And I'm only bringing this up so you understand in terms of other kinds of treatment. You know, the question oftentimes is, well, what else can I do along with homeopathy? Well, we don't want to do anything that interferes with the counteraction, obviously. That would be silly. And there's two ways in which the counteraction is disrupted. One is that another treatment is done that blocks the inflammatory response. And there's a lot of that kind of idea now in medicine, isn't there? You'll hear things like carbohydrates cause inflammation or the problem is inf inflammation and we have to stop the inflammation from happening. That's not really, a, I would say to you, a proper way to understand it. Inflammation is the way the body heals itself. If there is an ongoing inflammation, then that means there's something blocking the healing. That's why it continues like that. The body keeps trying to heal it. And it can't for some reason. There's something in the way, so to speak. The other way is uh, a treatment method that takes attention away from the counteraction. <clears throat> so think of it like this, that the remedy is given, the, 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 the organism, the intelligence of the organism responds to it with attention and does its thing. But if you now come in with another treatment, the attention of, that was given to the counteraction is diverted to this new thing that came in, if it is something that's gonna take that kind of attention. In other words, some things can be done, oh, say, um, in homeopathic treatment, maybe some massage or some mild herb or something, you know, that really isn't gonna have that strong an effect. 
<clears throat> and so it's not going to really take the attention away from the counteraction. But if you come within with something that does have a strong effect on the body, it's going to divert the attention away from the counteraction that was going on and stop the process. Now, the, the, the negative outcome of that is if either one of these things happen, that you block the inflammatory response or you take attention away from the counteraction, the initiating stimulus, in this case the wound, um, sort of dissipates, it's a, uh, the, the process is dissipated so that it doesn't complete itself. It leaves an uncured or partially cured state. <clears throat> In other words, um, if the infl inflammatory process is blocked in some way, later on when you stop blocking it, that doesn't mean it starts up again. It got blocked and then it's sort of like gets subdued, I guess you could say. So that's the problem. And you'll see that sometimes you may have experienced it yourself where something like this was done. You had a sprain or a, an injury that never completely healed properly. It was always sort of weak or always has some pain or something. Well, this is why, because the process was interfered with. So what are some of the most common things? Well, <clears throat> one most of us are familiar with is using cold packs. And a lot of people do this. They have an injury, a sprain or something, and they'll put ice pack or cold packs on the, on the injury to relieve the discomfort. Well, why, why does it have an effect? Well, if we go back to what I said about how the body responds by um, initiating a reaction from the rest of the organism so that the blood vessels expand and fluid comes into the area and, and uh, cells migrate and so on. <clears throat> when you put a cold pack on an area like that, it causes the blood vessels to contract. So now they can no longer do their job of coming into the area and healing it. And so that's why it's an interference. The body's starting to react by uh, beginning uh, and the, the inflammatory process, and then you come in and stop the inflammatory process by blocking it physically with the cold. Then you can see how that's going to be an interference. In other words, painkillers, <clears throat> because painkiller drugs <coughs> don't just... Um, they don't necessarily just relieve pain. They also they relieve pain usually because they stop inflammation in some way. And then anti-inflammatory drugs, especially steroids. Oh my gosh, they're a biggie. <clears throat> they're used so much now in medicine. It's interesting. Steroids. I'll give you quickly the story of steroids. <clears throat> Goes back quite a few decades. Um, Hans Selye is the doctor, the the scientist that discovered the them. And he was studying the adrenal glands and found out there was this uh, hormone release called cortisol that had to do with inflammation. Well, it turns out, I'll just give it to you briefly. He worked it all out that the body actually, in a way not surprising after what we've talked about, the body actually regulates inflammation. In other words, it uses inflammation to heal, but it doesn't let it happen without some control. And so it wants a certain amount of inflammation, but it doesn't want too much. So when there's an inflammatory process going on, then cortisol is released in various levels to control it because cortisol reduces inflammation. Then there's other substances that are released to stimulate inflammation. So the body basically regulates it. Once this was recognized by scientists, the cortisol had this ability. In their cleverness, they decided, let's make ones that are more powerful. So research was done to find uh, similar drugs to, or, or drugs that were similar to the natural hormone, cortisol, which we call corticosteroids, like prednisone and so on. And they're 10, 20 times more powerful than the natural cortisol. So they're completely unnatural. The body's never encountered anything that, that powerful before. And the effect of it, unfortunately, is to shut down not only inflammation, but it shuts down the immune system, 
causes the white blood cells in the blood to dissolve and so on. So it's really, they're really pretty nasty drugs. The last one is immune function depressants. Something is done to cause the immune function not to work properly. So those are the most common things that are done <clears throat> to block the, the healing process. <clears throat> so let's look at then <clears throat> having gone through all of this, <clears throat> what is the place of homeopathy in medicine? Well, I think that sometimes in today's world, you know, there's, there's not really quite an understanding that homeopathy was a method of treatment that was done by doctors, and they were doctors trained like any other doctor. In other words, in the history of homeopathic medicine, the history of medicine, those that embraced homeopathy were doctors like any others. They weren't like today's world, you might say, oh, there's homeopaths, and they're limited in what they can do, maybe. And, and you know, that can be because they're maybe not MDs or naturopaths or herbalists or something. And so that can be, but I just want to point out to you that homeopathy was part of medicine. And homeopathic doctors were like any others, and they could do tests and examinations and surgery, emergency treatments, set broken legs, all that stuff was done by homeopathic doctors. The only difference between them was that they used homeopathic remedies instead of drugs. That's what set them apart, is what we would call homeopathic doctors. Last thing I want to emphasize to you is that it's an ethical standard in homeopathic practice that the patient's response is never interfered with or suppressed. And you can see why. As Hahnemann says in the beginning of the Organon, the only purpose the physician has is to heal the patient. And so we take an ethical stand. We will not do anything to interfere with the patient's healing response. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming. All right. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry for all the coughing. <laughs> oh no, you did great, Richard. I think I think everybody can understand what it's like to have, have to talk even for a few seconds. Yeah, it, it's bronchitis. interesting. It's the only thing that's left of all this uh, bronchitis we had is just my throat just gets irritated at times. Otherwise, and it's gone. all you have to do today is talk. So you're going <laughs> to. No, thank you very much. And actually, we do have a bunch of questions. So thank you very much for an incredibly interesting talk. It's a little different than what we've been doing here at 4-H Canada. Oh, well, uh, I hope it was of interest. It certainly was to me, and I think to the audience as well, because we're getting lots of comments. Um, <laughs> let me see. Um, I have a question from Annalisa, who is a friend of mine um, and a fellow homeopath, and she's also a nurse, so she has a very good medical background. And she asks, so with reference to scar tissue, why does the body so often lay it down in such a mist, mismatched, non-functional format? And in your opinion, what remedies might help the formation of a more viable elastic scar tissue? Of course, where the other symptoms agree. I'm not sure I really fully understand that. She's saying that sometimes the scars don't, they seem to be sort of distorted or something? I guess that's her experience, that scar tissues seems, the body seems to lay it down in a mismatched, non-functional format. Has that been your experience? I can't think of any. Um, maybe there's just something I haven't noticed, but I, I think it probably, I would guess that probably what it is is something's interfered with it. Because usually the body heals it, seems quite well. Maybe it's a, it could be part of the, it might have to do with, you know, if an injury is, um, it can be in a place in the body where one still has to move it. And that probably, I can see how it could distort the scar because the tissues are keep pulling apart all the time. I'm sorry, I don't think I really have the knowledge she was asking for. I don't really understand exactly why that would happen. I'm just guessing maybe it has to do with the movement of the tissues prevents a proper well, we are getting a lot of questions since you did do that beautiful horse example with the scar tissue. A lot of people are asking for, you know, favorite remedies for scar tissue. And how would you respond when people ask you that kind of question? Well, I think there is a rubric, isn't there, in the repertory for um, wounds that don't quite heal properly or uh, wheels, wounds that continue to be uh, painful and so on. I can't remember what the, how the wording is, but I think there are some rubrics like that, aren't there, Robin? Yeah, and there's certainly, well, in the parlance of homeopathy, it would be under something called cicatrices, 
which is how yeah, we, yeah. they scars. Uh huh. Yeah, I know. I haven't used those very much myself. I haven't found them necessary to, <clears throat> but yes, I can see that there could be rubrics like that that address this issue that it doesn't quite heal right. Um, or, or, or get stuck at a certain point. I think that's where I would go. I'd look at those remedies. So somebody was asking about painful uh, <coughs> scars. Uh, Annalisa was asking about a viable elastic scar tissue, something that would help for formation of a more viable. Would you go, do you have like, you know, an, a topical application that you would recommend or do you recommend people come see a homeopath and try to figure out what's going on? Well, usually if I'm going to use any topical, it's usually some form of calendula. That's an amazing, amazing remedy. I mean, it's just, oh my God, the stuff I've seen it do, you know. I think I'd start there. Uh, but again, I don't think I really have the knowledge in my head because for some reason, I guess I haven't dealt with that kind of problem very much. But I would certainly go look at the rubrics that have to do with wounds not healing completely, not healing, um, or they still have residual problems or pain or something. And then I would use that rubric to go to Materia Medica and read the remedies. Thank you. And well, I think that's people, where the clue would be. And you know, if, if I don't know if it, more than what people want to do that are listening, you know, I mean, I know you're not all practitioners, but I was going to say to you, one of the best materia medica for that kind of detail is what's called Herring's Guiding Symptoms. And it's a 10 volume set. It's not terribly expensive. It's probably about $100 or so. It's the ones I ever printed in India. I think you can get them for really rather inexpensive, but maybe it's more than you want to do. But anyway, the reason I mentioned those to you <clears throat> is that they're quite extensive. Like, for example, you might have a remedy like Pulsatilla might be in Buriki or some other book like that might be four pages. And then Harry's got his symptoms over 100 pages of symptoms. <laughs> but there's a section in the, in the Materia Medica where it, it's, the title of it is Tissues. And that's where you read a lot of this detail about what actually happens physically in the tissues, parts of the body. Very, very useful information for remedies. Thank you. So what I would do, if I were going to study this, what you brought up, I would look at the rubric to see what remedies have to do with helping wounds to heal completely. Then I'd go to herrings and I'd look up under the tissue section what it says about the different parts of the body and, the, and it would talk about the healing there, you see. That's where my mind would go with it. And that's great for the homeopaths out there. And for those of you who are not homeopaths are not about to buy 10 volumes of herring's garden. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they uh, should homeopath. become homeopaths. Because <laughs> 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 and a, a faster one would be to consult with a, a, a professional homeopath. That's yeah, awesome. yeah, you certainly could do that, of course. Uh -huh. Um, just if, since we're over, oh, we're not over time, we're good. So Tana had a question about isopathy. You had mentioned it uh, in homeopathy. Isopathy means same suffering. Yeah. And uh, she recalls you saying that it would cause more suffering and she wants you to know. It that, can. To yeah. explain that a bit more, please. Well, I think it's, um, that's what's observed, you know. Um, <clears throat> like for instance, say you're stung by a bee and then people, if they use apis, you know. And if you look at the, if you look at the repertories, for example, uh, bee sting, you won't find apis listed as one of the remedies. It's other remedies that are similar. Um, my experience with it is if you use the same thing that seemed to cause it, like that example of, of bee venom or poison oak, say you use, poison, you use rust tox, sometimes it does seem to help, but other times I've seen it cause aggravation. So it's, you, you can't predict what's gonna happen. Um, I, it's not like it always causes a problem, but I have seen, uh, as you know, unfortunate reactions sometimes where there's more pain. And I remember somewhere, I don't remember who the, who the practitioner was. I'm trying to think of the guy's name. It doesn't really matter, I guess. But anyway, somebody had said to him something about using a, the same substance. He said, oh, no, they already had enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, it's just a little unpredictable. The same substance and a potency may be, uh, may be helpful, but again, as I say, it's more consistently, if you use a similar remedy, it's, it's un unlikely you're going to have an aggravation that's uncomfortable. Whereas with isopathy, you will uh, encounter that. And for people out there who don't know what isopathy means, it means treating the illness with the same substance. substance. So Dr. Pitcairn gave the example of apis, which is made from bee, for a bee sting, that's what Yeah, 
if you know what if you know what the cause was, not you know, like for it could be a poisoning. Let's say that your dog is poisoned by a flea chemical, and so you make a remedy out of the flea chemical. I wouldn't advise that. I'd use more remedies that are used for poisonings. You know, uh, snake bites, and so you use uh, bitten by rattlesnakes. You use crotalus. I I would rather use lachesis or some other remedy. You just find it goes much easier and smoother if you use, as Hanuman points out, it has to be similar, he says, not the same. Right, so don't don't give homeopathic chocolate for your dog who ate too much chocolate. No, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> as I say, it might work, because some people out there may say, oh, I did it and it worked. Yeah, sometimes you'll see that. It's just that it's unreliable. Always match the symptoms. Yeah, you want to use something, a similar remedy. That's the, that's the principle of the homeopathic treatment, and that's what Hanuman emphasized to us. And I would agree, you know, that's what works best. <clears throat> Crystal had a question about um, amount to use, and I don't know if you can answer it, um, but she wonders if there's a correlation. She, your case of the Arnica calendula and uh, Cacaria carbonica, she says, is there a correlation on the size of the animal or the wound with the amount, the, I guess, the strength of the remedy and even the amount of the remedy? Uh, potency versus amount of pills. Well, both issues. Is there a correlation with the size of the animal or the severity of the wound with the strength of the medicine, let's say, or the size of the dose? Well, you know, over the years, when I started out, I heard various things, you know, like <clears throat> one that comes to mind is I remember some, quite some years ago, I was giving a talk at a conference and I, I presented some animal cases in which I'd used high potencies like 10M and so on, which I do in my practice regularly anyway. I, mean, so I use a whole range of potencies. <clears throat> and somebody in the audience stood up and says, you can't use those kind of potencies in animals. They can't respond to anything over a 30C. I'm thinking, whoa, <laughs> here I've been using it for years, you know. We're, I don't know where these ideas come from. I would say, from my experience, that animals respond to the potency scale just the same as humans. I don't see any difference. As far as their size, I don't think it matters. The, the, what, what I use as my guide is I want them to taste it. It doesn't matter if it's you know a little bit of liquid or pills or whatever it is you give, just enough of them that they can taste it on their tongue. That's, that's what I tell people. Um, <clears throat> the amount isn't really critical. I would say more if you have something that's, if you have a, say, say if you're an animal that collapses, it might die. You know, it, it, something happens to it such that it falls down, maybe going unconscious or seizuring or whatever. It's really, it's really pretty serious. Rather than worry about the amount or the, even the potency is the repetition. Give it more often. Give it every five minutes, every 15 minutes or whatever until they respond. That's more important. As far as potency scales, you can use the whole scale. I usually used... A lot of my cases, I start with 30 or 200. Uh, I've used the whole range. Uh, I tend to prefer remedies most of the time above 30. Uh, and I have used um, um, 10M, 50M, CM, even MM in cases. So I say animals respond just fine to those. <clears throat> and there's a lot of people who say that if you have the right remedy, it almost doesn't even matter what the strength is yeah i would agree uh, though i can't in his writings james kent uh, talked about um uh cases where it, it did seem to make a difference which potency was used he, he's given some cases in his writings where a person would receive a i, I may not remember it right but i was going to say even maybe like a higher potency they didn't respond then he gave a lower 30 or something and they did i haven't particularly seen that kind of thing myself it seems like that it just needs to be a potency adequate enough to have a, to initiate a reaction. That's our goal. So you, you put it very simply, as a practitioner doing this kind of work, you're presented with an individual that has a pattern. You match the pattern to the remedy, hopefully. You've done it accurately. The next thing that you're trying to accomplish is that they have a counteraction. Now, the counteraction may not happen with a 30. It may only happen with a 200. Occasionally, you'll see that. Or you may have to repeat it, especially in, in acute problems. 
maybe you have to give it every four hours for a few doses to get a proper reaction. But you're always watching to see that they are going to have a reaction. And once the reaction starts, you need to back off and stop giving the remedy. Terrific. So, uh, you know, I think we have time for one more question. And so we'll end on this one from Ria, who is touching on what you're talking about right now. And she wants you to differentiate between aggravation and counteraction. Aggravation and counteraction? Yeah, after you've given the remedy and it's had its primary <laughs> effect. She wants to just understand the nomenclature of aggravation and counteraction. Okay. The, the, what, what we call aggravation, the homeopathic aggravation, uh, uh, you know, I'm referring to what Hanna, how Hahnemann described it. The homeopathic aggravation is the primary effect of the remedy. So the remedy that's given, let's assume that it's a remedy that's similar to the patient's condition. <clears throat> and you give it in an amount, maybe you've repeated it or you've given it um, in a potency such that the, the effect, the primary effect of the remedy exceeds the condition that was in the patient. So it has a stronger effect. And Hahnemann describes that in the Organon. He says the remedy, the medicine is going to have a stronger effect than the natural disease, if it's similar. That we can adjust the effect by how much we give and what the potency is. So let's say you give a remedy and the, and the primary effect of the remedy is that it causes a similar state, but that similar state is stronger, if you will, or more intense than what was there before. So that's what's called a homeopathic aggravation. It's uh, not a bad thing, necessarily. One doesn't want to have it, but it's not a bad thing. In fact, Kent tells us that it's a very good sign that you're on the right track. So, the, um, sorry, phone's ringing. I don't think I can easily stop it here. Just pick it up and hang up. Okay, um, so um, the, the homeopathic effect then, or the, I should say the primary effect, is uh, coming directly from the, the substance itself. So <coughs> it would follow then, of course, that the effect would be immediate, right? You give the remedy and within a, a short time, a minute, so a few minutes, maybe a little longer, then you see this effect, the primary effect is visible to you. And that primary effect then is, happens very quickly after the substance is given. In addition, it doesn't usually last very long, a few minutes, maybe a half hour, or something like that. Uh, it's brief, it wears off on its own, unless you're repeating the remedy, which can happen, so that people don't know. And they keep repeating it and the, and the animal gets <laughs> more and more symptoms, you know. So uh, to define the homeopathic aggravation, it's a primary effect of the substance exceeding the natural disease, and it happens uh, uh, very quickly, immediately after the remedy is given. The counteraction, was that the other part of it she's asking? Yes, counteraction, yeah. wasn't it, Robin? Counteraction slash yeah. aggravation. The counteraction occurs after the primary effect. So the counteraction is not going to occur until the homeopathic aggravation is ended. And then it's the reaction of the patient. And so in an acute case, you see the counteraction. Let's say that you're treating the acute case, you give the remedy, there's no aggravation, and the counteraction starts within just a few minutes. They start to get better. Or you can have a case where you give the remedy, there is an aggravation, in 10 minutes it's gone, and now the counteraction begins. But they always follow one another. They don't occur at the same time. The counteraction is different than the aggravation. The counteraction comes from the patient. It's not the aggravation. Now, I want to I want to emphasize to you, there is some confusion about this because we tend to use the word aggravation rather loosely to mean when the symptom is increased, when the symptom is more intense. Understandably, we say, oh, it's aggravated. But... <clears throat> And you'll see even homeopaths, even Kent writes that way sometimes where he talks about aggravation, but he's really talking about something other than the homeopathic aggravation. So it's a little confusing. <clears throat> but I'm telling you that the proper way to understand it is 
when we use the word aggravation to refer to the homeopathic effect, it's referring to the primary effect of the remedy. That's all it refers to. The counteraction is entirely different and occurs from the patient in reaction to the substance. In an acute case, very quickly. In a chronic case, oftentimes you'll see it after two days, three days, after, if you're giving a single dose. Let's say I have a chronic case in an animal and I give a 10 M. I'll often start to see the counteraction uh, on the second or third day. Does that help? I think that's a great answer. Fantastic. Even for people like me who are fully trained, it was a great answer. <laughs> good, good. So thank you. So we'll, we'll end with one, uh, just a more pleasant question, hopefully. Um, and if you can put the next slide up while we're, you answer that because it, it will. Um, Tana was interested to know how well you are accepted within veterinary medicine and oh. are there at schools that accept you as a guest lecturer and she's curious which ones have. Maybe she That's wants a to go to that will be amenable to homeopathy. Yeah. Well, I, um, when I went into the, uh, when I began, became interested in homeopathy and started to focus on it and use it, <clears throat> I basically, in a sense, withdrew from the usual field of medicine. What I mean by that is that I, um, maybe it would make sense to some of you to say, if you really are captivated by the homeopathic method, because you, you see the response, I could get, tell you stories that happened to me early on, that, oh my God, I didn't know that was possible, you know? So if you get caught up in it, you get captivated by it, and you really want to use it, a corollary of that is you lose interest in the other method. Because the other method you were taught is the counter, is, a, is a, the allopathic method, is a method of, um, and if, uh, basically using some kind of a substance or, or, or a device or a method, surgery or whatever, to basically block the healing response is what it comes down to, you know. You, you're countering the symptoms. The symptoms, the symptoms in the patient are always there as part of the healing response. That the, the life force, and Hahnemann points this out in the organon, the life force does the best it can do to heal the patient. And so the symptoms that appear, no matter how nasty they are, are the attempts by the life force of the patient to, to bring about uh, a healing. It's interesting um, that Hahnemann also in the Organon says that the life force isn't particularly effective at doing this. Did you, have you run across that, Robin? Have you ever sure. seen that? Sure. It's not particularly effective. He says, don't imitate it. Because doctors in medicine began to imitate what the life force did. In other words, you might see that a, a, a child has pneumonia. And then as they recover from the pneumonia, finally, if they do, they break out in a profuse sweat. So they said, aha, they have to sweat to get well. So that can then develop sweat, sweating chambers. You, know, you put people that are sick into a, and force them to sweat. Another one might be that the person develops diarrhea before they get well from a disease. So the doctor said, oh, we may have to make them have diarrhea. So they would give them drugs that cause them to have diarrhea. Hahnemann says, don't do those kind of things. The life force is not particularly effective in bringing about healing. Now, he says, interestingly, he says, the reason, and I mean, this is a just as something to bring up for you guys to ponder because it's a really good question. We don't necessarily have an easy answer for it. Hahnemann says the life force is not particularly effective in its method of bringing about health again because when the, health when the life force was created, it was not created to deal with disease. So what that means is, to me, when the life force was created, there was no disease. Diseases come about later. Uh, it's in a, and, and Kent writes about that in his philosophy and other places where we base, I would say, I'll throw it out for consideration, 
that we human beings have created disease. And the life force was never really meant to deal with it. Anyway, I'm really on a digression. You're asking about how I did, and I would say I lost interest in the conventional approach. And I stopped going to meetings and taking training and so on. And I just focused on homeopathy. <clears throat> so yes, I'm sure I had a lot of judgment against me, but I didn't care. I didn't hear it. I didn't go there to ask for it. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, in practice for quite a long time. I never had any particular problems uh, being called up before boards or anything. Um, as far as the place of homeopathy in veterinary medicine, there's definitely uh, uh, an interest in it. It's not a large interest. There's a much larger interest in um, Chinese medicine and acupuncture, chiropractic. In my opinion, um, the, the difficulty for homeopathy is that it's based on the understanding that we are not really truly physical beings, we're spiritual beings. We're energetic beings. And homeopathy is addressing that energetic aspect of what we are. And that's very difficult for a lot of people to take on. Uh, materialism is very strong in our culture. We're really wedded to it. And that's very, you have to basically give up the idea of materialism. It'd be an interesting topic to go into because uh, that's what's happened in physics. Quantum physics is basically discarded materialism. And it said our physical world is not like we think it is. It's really in energetic patterns and so on. So it's a really interesting that the science has moved in that direction, but medicine has not. Medicine is very materialistic. That, you know, sometimes we joke about it and say, the usual view of what we are is that we're meat bags. <clears throat> And Hahnemann makes it very clear in the Organon that we're not that, we're spiritual beings. And the homeopathy is treating at that level. So uh, to answer your question, homeopathy is not real big. It, it, there's interest, uh, but it's not growing rapidly. Uh, and I think, as I say, the basic issue is that we still, as you, to really embrace homeopathy fully and get the best results from it, you have to give up the idea of a materialistic world. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you know, Richard, I never thought in a million years you would go in this direction, but I'm so glad that that question was asked because we got the privilege of hearing you say something incredibly important for all of us to understand about the nature of disease, the nature of medicine, the nature of humankind. And thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful comment at the end. Oh, good, good. I'm really happy for everybody who stayed and mostly everybody did. So here we go. Um, speaking of material things, we will be talking about <laughs> cell salts um, in our next talk. Um, cell salts can be a little confusing to people. For those people who are not in school, we are taught this. In my case, I was taught it in the first weekend, so it really confused the hell out of me because I had no idea what it was about. But we all have a lot of different salts within us and there's some thinking from some people that the balance of cell salts within the body uh, help uh, control whether our response, the uh, capacity to respond to pathogens and, and how we could stay healthy <coughs> that way. So it's another prong in the fork of uh, defense against disease, uh, homeopathy being one of them, certainly cell salts, uh, homeopathic cell salts, because they're prepared in homeopathic fashion, that's why they're called that, is just yet another one. And especially with cold season coming up, I know personally I take some cell salts whenever I feel something coming on and it very often nips it in the bud. So I really, really recommend every Everybody come back for this and tell your friends about it. It's a very good class. Uh, and because it's homeopathic, it's not such a material dose, right? So uh, we have some thanks coming in for you, Dr. Uh, Pitcairn, oh. and especially for answering that last question in detail. Uh, oh, he's good. a vet from India practicing vet homeopathy. He, and I know it's, it's uh, quite late in India right now if you're there. So thanks. Oh, yeah. yeah, it would be late, wouldn't it? Yeah. Ten and a half hours later from here. So quite <laughs> thank you, Dr. Patel, for coming. And tell all your friends you can watch the course later. So come next time, everybody. And if we can get the last class, we're going to the next class will be January 16th. And we just want to thank you very much from Poor Homeopathy Canada. If you're not already members, please become. It's free. And uh, we really are trying to support everybody in Canada, especially to uh, make sure that homeopathy stays extant. I know you're going through some stuff in the States now with the FDA, Richard, with with uh, uh, they're trying to uh, limit various uh, remedies because 
Of course, they're both um, completely useless and completely toxic at the same time. We all know that. Well, it's, it's so interesting, the, the, the lack of logic about it, you know. <clears throat> the, on the one hand, people will say, oh, homeopathy can't do anything. There's nothing in it. And then the FDA or others will come along and say, oh, it's got poison in it. Well, it's like, it can't be both, right? <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, we're going to end. Uh, we've already been asked by somebody, if you're going to come lecture again, you're always welcome to join us, Dr. Pitkin. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's been fun. All right. So that's it for today, everybody. I uh, wish you all a fabulous holiday season. Same to you, Dr. Pitcairn. Take care of your bronchitis. Please, please, please. We know, we know a few good homeopaths if you need some help. Oh, I'll just take some cell salts. There you go. <laughs> you might be a little late for that. You're already at the third stage of inflammation, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> and we wish everybody a great afternoon and evening and night, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye.